Yeah. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Microstructure Exchange. Uh, today we have uh, Dermot Murphy uh, presenting a paper on the competition for retail order flow and market quality. It's not the Mort, uh, as we <coughs> misspelled uh, Dermot's first name in, in, in the email. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's um, all right. Uh, before uh, we begin, let me uh, highlight again uh, uh, the little advertisement we do for the, the Future of Financial Information Conference uh, that is usually at Stockholm Business School in, in the spring, but next year it will be in Paris at AGC. And uh, uh, on our website, we have a, a link uh, to, for the call for papers uh, that is now uh, up, and uh, I'll post that in the, in the chat as well. Um, uh, so I, I'm going to hand over to uh, to Dermot, but uh, uh, just for the format, uh, Dermot has asked uh, to to take the questions uh, in uh, in the in question breaks. That uh, so he will have a, a break after the the introduction, I suppose, and then another one uh, during the talk. And um, you can uh, then raise your hand uh, to. Uh, to, uh, and I'll uh, let you speak, or you can also uh, at any time write your uh, questions in the chat. And um, uh, Edwin, who uh, who's the, the co-author here, he will uh, he's also here, so maybe he can uh, respond to uh, to questions in in the chat as well. Dermot, the screen is yours. All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks uh, very much for uh, having me here, uh, here today. So. Uh, yeah, the title of the paper is Competition for Retail Order Flow and Market Quality. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at uh, internalization, basically how competition for that sort of retail order flow can ultimately affect uh, uh, market quality. So we take a competition angle in this paper, and I, I hope you find this paper interesting and, and learn something from it today. So this is uh, with uh, my co-author, uh, Eddie Hu from NYU. Uh, so yeah, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, here we go. So anyway, let me first talk about uh, the current state of retail trading in U.S. equities. So it is an increasingly important segment of U.S. equities markets. Uh, we estimate it's about 30 percent of all trading volume uh, right now, which uh, corresponds to about 100 trillion dollars in trading volume in 2021. And much of this retail trading volume, if not almost all, it's facilitated by uh, online uh, brokerages such as Robinhood and E-Trade and, uh, and TD and so on. And so exchange competition nowadays is intense. Like you have about, I think, I think now you have 16 uh, lit stock exchanges and 35 dark pools. But despite this, like retail orders, like quite often never see the light of day. What I mean by the light of day is that most retail orders, they are rooted, routed to um, pretty much six market making firms. And this arrangement is called payment for order flow because these market making firms, uh, they pay the brokerage um, a small amount per share in exchange to have uh, the order uh, routed uh, to, uh, uh, to the market maker. Um, now, two of these firms get quite a lot of the volume. Citadel and Virtu, they internally execute about 70% of all retail orders. So if it's about $100 trillion in retail trading in 2021, 70% of that, it's about $70 trillion or 21% of all trading volume. So that's quite a lot that is exclusive to Citadel and Virtu. Something else I want to point out from our analysis is that internalization is highly concentrated. So if we look at, if we look exclusively at internalization volume uh, and, we, um, and we determine the Herfindahl index for the internalizers, because you can see basically the internalized uh, retail order flow for each of the market making firms, then you can figure out the market share within uh, retail trading uh, and then figure out the uh, the Herfindahl Hirschman index, the HHI. And uh, we find that it is typically greater than 2,500. Um, and this and 2,500 is an important cutoff, at least by the Department of Justice when it comes to mergers. They consider um, an industry to be highly concentrated uh, if the HHI is above 2,500. Now, this is for mergers, of course, uh, and that's uh, a different from, uh, from internalization, but I thought that the, that the numbers were interesting nonetheless. 
Something else that's interesting to note is, is that uh, the HHI has increased quite a lot from 2018 to 2021. It's increased by about 450 points. Going back to the, uh, the DOJ slash FTC guidelines, they consider an increase of more than 200 points to be, uh, to be a concern from an antitrust perspective. Again, it's from the perspective of mergers, but I thought that the increase of 450 points was still notable uh, relative to, uh, uh, to their baseline um, of 200. So I included some graphs on the right here that illustrate some of these points. Like the top right graph shows that internal, um, that the percentage of internalized retail order flow has grown since 2017. It's gone from about 21% to about 27% uh, of all trading volume. And you can see that the HHI has significantly increased as well. I'd say the lowest is in 2018 at about, um, at about 2,500, but it has since, as of 2021, gone up to about, uh, about 2,850, 2,900. And the bottom right graph, it, it, it shows the, uh, the market share for each of the internalizers. And you can see that Citadel and Virtu, like I'm saying in the slide already, they seem to take up the, uh, the lion's share of uh, retail order flow, like most of it go goes to them. And you can see that it has been increasing for Citadel from 2017 to 2021. And it's pretty much the same case for Virtu. So the increase in the HHI that, uh, that we're documenting on the top right, they are attributed to uh, the increases for uh, Citadel and Virtu on the bottom right. And you can see that for the rest of the market making firms, G1, Two Sigma, and so on, it's, it's remained about level. Um, Wolverine seems to be an exception. They've kind of dropped off a bit. As far as we can tell from Rule 606 reports, it seems that Wolverine isn't uh, active in uh, the, uh, the equity market uh, payment forward flow space anymore, uh, but they still appear to be active in, in the options payment forward flow space. And there are a few great uh, papers about options of payment forward flow. Uh, that, that you should check out as well, but I won't get into them here today, but uh, there are also some really great papers on that. So what are the implications of all this for market quality, this increasing market concentration? Well, there, there, there are two sides to the debate, pretty much as always. So some proponents like to say that large market makers, they can use their economies of scale to provide better liquidity and better price improvement. You know, they have larger balance sheets and they can absorb more uh, one-sided retail order flow and, uh, and, and basically provide more liquidity. Because otherwise, if you don't have a large market maker, then as Doug Sifu, the Virtu CEO, would ask, who's going to supply that? The liquidity ferry? So that's, uh, that's an argument for concentration in the payment for order flow space. But opponents suggest that when competition is weak, then there's minimal price improvement for retail orders. Like you frequently observe price improvement of a hundredth of a penny uh, per share, and oftentimes a tenth of a penny per share. So that's very little price improvement on say a 100 share order. So you get that relative to the national best bid and offer. So the national best bid and offer might be uh, $10 and 10, 10, and they'll improve upon your mar uh, marketable uh, buy order by giving you um, basically a hundred of a penny uh, below uh, $10 and 10 cents. I would also say that this price improvement is unlikely to explain zero commissions. People like to talk about zero commissions a lot nowadays. Um, and I suppose that some of the, um, of the payment forward flow regime can be attributed to, uh, uh, to zero commissions. Uh, we estimate it's probably, it could uh, explain about 50 cents of the reduction in commissions, but commissions have gone down by about, generally about five bucks these days, as in they've gone from $5 to zero. But we think that payment forward flow is unlikely to explain uh, the complete uh, elimination of commissions. So Gary Gensler, current SEC chair, talking about payment forward flow, he says that market concentration can deter healthy competition, limit innovation. So the SEC does have their eye on payment forward flow and they are, they are thinking about how to improve the market structure these days, if it needs improvement at all. Opponents also like to say that exchanges now have to more toxic informed order flow. And this is a more traditional argument about, uh, about payment forward flow. If you're taking away more of the uninformed retail orders from the exchange, then that leaves more uh, informed order flow on the exchange. And when there's more informed order flow, that's more adverse selection to the market maker. So spreads need to be widened. The public market makers need to widen their spreads. But internalization 
the price improvement is linked to those spreads. So wider spread, slight price improvement, it sounds like that can make retail traders overall worse off if the spread is that much wider, even if there is some price improvement. And we like to argue in this paper as, as well that if your market maker is oligopolistic or monopolistic, your internalizer, uh, then they have less incentive to use the profits that they make from internalization to compete more in the public marketplace. So spreads are going to stay wide. They take away the retail order flow and that widens spreads, but there's no like subsidization of the bid after spread because the profits are retained by the monopolistic internalizers or the oligopolistic internalizers. So we're gonna formalize these ideas with a modified Blossom Milgram model that does have pain order flow and imperfect competition. And so what we predict is that spreads are widest in monopolistic internalizer setting. You know, I'll pause here. I think I've been talking too much. Does anybody have any questions so far? I do actually, there are multiple. Can you hear me well? I can, yes. yeah, thanks. Go ahead. So does the, like the internalization also include the institutional trades, right? Because the virtue and study law are also executed the trades from institutions. I mean, so we are talking here about the payment for order flow, which is about the uh, retail order. And also these are the two big market makers who are executing large amount of institutional trades as well. So how can you separate these two? I mean, what, what we could argue is that like we feel pretty confident that like most of this retail order flow is coming from uh, platforms like Robinhood uh, and E-Trade and so on. And if you look at the 606 reports, you see that uh, this is quite a lot of volume that is being shipped uh, to these internalizers. So, you know, based on what we're looking at from the, from the rule 606 reports, it does seem like it is quite a lot of retail order flow. I think that institutional order flow uh, is in there as well. Uh, I wish we knew like what percentage it was institutional, but we feel pretty confident that uh, that the institutional order flow is going to be a pretty low percentage of this uh, this like non ATS order flow that we're looking at. Okay, thank you. Hey Dermot, Andrew here from Virtu. Um, hey, Andrew, quick question for you: um, How are you defining retail volume? Because your numbers seem about thirty percent higher than what the rest of the industry considers retail. How are we defining retail volume? Uh, so we're, we're using the FINRA data to define retail volume. And uh, this is from uh, the, the non-ATS uh, data that we're looking at. Um, you know, we, we have some uh, data issues with the FINRA um, uh, volume in the sense that um, you don't always see uh, the volume if it goes below a certain threshold. Um, so, uh, when it comes to the smaller stocks, um, uh, we we have to uh, we have to partially infer some of the retail volume. Uh, but generally, we are using the FINRA data, which is the non-ATS data, which identifies it by the stock week uh, for the different internalizers. Gotcha. And why would you do that instead of looking at six hundred five volume? Six hundred five volume, because um, that's the actual retail volume. I think it's mainly because like the FINRA data is the data that we that we have access to. Uh, we can try looking at the 605 volume to see if it matches up. I mean, uh, based public. on what we looked at from other studies, it seems like that the retail volume, like it, it matches up pretty closely. You say 30%, I'll have to look and see um, uh, how the methodology from the study you're thinking about differs from ours. Uh, but, uh, uh, but we think it's a reasonable ballpark to think about it being in the range of about uh, 25, 30%. Gotcha. So the numbers for based on public 605 reports for wholesale um, market making, you just again based on 606 reports, put it right at about um, 20. Let me get the exact one here. Sorry, I don't want to misstate here. Um, I'll say like 21%. It, it's it's not very. It's not 30%. That's for sure. Um, here we go. Let me open it. I think we're talking about two different things. So we're oh. measuring average stock level using the FINRA data, whereas for 605, you're talking about aggregated across the whole market. So I think that's why we're talking about different numbers. Uh, okay, so you're saying for the uh, average yeah, stock, point. and I guess why is that sample. instead of, of your sample? Because we okay. need to do stock level analysis. We can't just look at the overall aggregate market volume and make any sort of inferences. 
Gotcha. I guess just on your prior slide, you had 30% of all trading volume is internalized. If you go up one slide, I think. Okay, if I go back a slide, okay. Well, uh, we'll, we'll double check about this. Uh, we'll, we'll double check to see if this no, is no, average. If no it is average, at all. then we'll make sure to change that so that it says it's the average across the stocks. Uh, but if it is the average across the stocks, and that means that uh, we might, um, if it doesn't match up the rule 60, um, uh, the rule 606 data uh, or 605, then I, I would think that if this one is doing an average, that means we are going to, um, we're going to slightly understate in some stocks and slightly overstate in other stocks. I guess uh, yeah, I think one the stock level notice, average in the paper is yeah, like the FINRA 24%. Data, so the FINRA data was going to include a lot of volume um, that's, that comes from the single dealer platforms that various wholesalers also operate. So it's going to include all of the institutional volume, um, all of our principal versus institutional volume, as well as Citadels, if you use the FINRA data. Yeah, and that, and that, that relates back to Eunice's question uh, that's, uh, are we confident that we're fully capturing retail volume? Uh, you know, we work with the data we have, and uh, there is going to be some institutional uh, volume from the SDPs. Um, so uh, that, that might ramp down yeah. a little bit. Uh, what percentage of uh, volume do you think is in the SDPs uh, relative to the internalization platforms? You um, know? Well, I mean, just, just looking at public 60, 605 data, it was 23%. Excuse me, I think I said 21% earlier. So 605 volume as a percent of total TCV in 2021 was 23%. And in 2020, it was 21%. And in 2019, it was 13. And in 2018, it was 13. Um, and so I guess any delta between those in any of those years would be your institutional percentage. All right, sounds good. So, so the summary statistics we're reporting about retail volume, we'll, we'll put in a caveat that says that uh, we, we might want to round it down a little bit to when we're looking at the aggregates to take into account the SDP volume. Gotcha, gotcha. And then one, one other thing really quick, I apologize for hijacking a little bit here. Um, you mentioned something about there's less incentive to compete to narrow the spreads on exchange um, yes. by wholesalers. I guess that that's the connotation is that there's an incentive to keep the spreads wide. Um, do you have a sense, I'm asking because I, I don't know the answer, um, what percent of the displayed quote on the MBBO is from wholesalers? We happen to think it's incredibly low. Um, you like, happen to think lo, like low single uh, I'm not sure. Percent. I wish we had data that was able to that where we were able to tell that. Like what we would really like to have is basically ID level data that that's able to track market makers over time. I've worked with Canadian data before where you're able to look at this sort of thing uh, for a study of high frequency trading, and that's the kind of data that you'd really want. Uh, but it's incredibly hard to get data like that. You know, there's often uh, stakeholders out there that that will will be against releasing that sort of data. And, uh, you know, it would be nice if we could get it, but it's just not possible. So maybe you have a better idea of like the percentage of times that wholesalers are at the best MBBO. My prior is that it's high. Your prior is that it's low. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, but maybe there's a study out there that does answer that, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure off the top of my head. That would, that would be interesting. Um, and then one last point here is that the, the de minimis price improvement, we have heard that statistic before where, where people kind of point to that chart that looks like a little bit of a field goal where you have a lot of fills happening at the you know, 0 0.0001 and a lot of fills happening at the 0 0.0009 increment and kind of point to that as de minimis price improvement. Um, you know, one thing, and we looked into this within the last couple of weeks, just because I was curious. Um, you know, we always talk about size improvement, right? How much more size is filled than is displayed at the MBBO? And there are fills where there's you know, no price improvement you know, as determined by the actual execution price, but that order that got no price improvement, meaning it it sold at the, you know, at the bid, um, was filled for you know seven times the amount of size that were published that was available across all the bids, and so in in that case that order got significant price improvement though it would not show up as an improved price. Similarly, there's a lot of orders that get, you know, about half of the orders that are filled at, you know, quote unquote de minimis price improvement 0 0.0001 and 0 0.0009 are also um, receiving significant size improvement. So just kind of, you know, look, make sure we're looking at these things in multiple dimensions, not just the, the price without taking that into consideration. Yeah, so uh, I mean, our, our price improvement metrics are, are partially uh, based on uh, what we see in our own data. We're also looking at things like the, the NASDAQ reports that shows like the price improvement and shows like 
the distribution of where it is. And uh, we often see it at either a hundred, like at least according to that report, you see it at a hundredth of a penny or a tenth of a penny or two tenths of a penny. I think that those are the ones you see the most frequently, uh, but I'll, I'll double check the NASDAQ report to see uh, if they say anything with the size improvement uh, matter. No, they, they, no, they don't. Say, you know, same with the NYC report. They're both kind of conveniently silent about that, uh, which you, I mean, to be fair, like they don't always have that data. It's not impossible for them to know by any means. It's a little frustrating that nobody else has actually looked at that yet, uh, both either in academic academia or uh, from an exchange perspective to kind of say like, look, all these trades that happen, it's knowable, right? Which is kind of fun. You can kind of look at all the TRF prints that execute at those sub penny price improvements at those de minimis levels and say, how big were those trades relative to the displayed size in those instances? And you can kind of walk back and say, okay, these are, these are fills that where, you know, somebody committed more capital than was available and filled an order than was immediately of more, at a more size than it was available, immediately available. Sorry, I'm choking over my words today. And, you know, this exactly reflects this, uh, this point that comes from, uh, from Doug. Uh, at Virtu, like you are, uh, that um, that size improvement is something that we can do because we are a large market maker. So uh, this is some value added that we bring uh, to the market. Uh, so this is exactly what what proponents uh, would say. Uh, so this is something that you know we can definitely explore in the data if we have sufficient data to do it. So this is something we're going to uh, seriously no, think I, about. I, yeah, I, mean, I think it's knowable based on public information to a large extent. You can look at mm -hmm. trades, oversized, you know, trades that happen on the TRF that are for more size. Than were available across all the NBBO in that instance. If you can Nobody's convince regulators to, to give us the transaction level TRF data, we'd be happy to add that analysis to our paper. No, I mean, that's like everything I just said is available in the, um, what do you call it? What does Night Ice call it? The, the TAC. Everything I just said is in the TAC data. Except for the venue where it executed. Well, you don't even need that, right? You can just say if it executed at the TRF, full stop. And say so, that uh, maybe I jump in here and uh, suggest that uh, you, you follow up on those details of the data. Yep, uh, I apologize. Off, off Sorry. Off no, course, I appreciate we, it. Sorry, guys. Uh, good no, we very much appreciate it as well. Yeah. So, uh, Dermot, I, I think I, I see no other questions at the moment. So, I think you should move on. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So, um, so let me provide a preview of, of our results. So um, what we find is that internalization is associated with worse market quality in a correlative sense, uh, especially with stocks uh, that have a weak competition for retail order flow as measured by our internalizer Herfindahl index. So what we find, and this is a cross-sectional study, we find that for every 17 percentage point increase in internalized volume, uh, and that's a percentage of all volume. And so that's a, that's a standard deviation increase. This measure is associated with spreads that are 3.8 basis, uh, basis points wider in low HHI stocks and 10.9 basis points uh, wider in high HHI stocks. So the more retail order flow that's internalized away from the public stock exchange, the wider spreads are, which is, which is consistent with the cream skimming argument. Uh, that you've seen in the older literature, but when we take the competition angle, we say we see that this is especially pronounced in the high HHI stocks, the ones that are in the upper tercile of the Herfindahl index. We also look at price improvement, which is the ratio of, um, of effective spread to quoted spread, and this is a standard industry metric for how much better you do uh, than the quoted spread as an incoming uh, trader submitting a market order or marketable limit order. And we find that price improvement is 5.5 percentage points worse um, for every standard deviation increase in percentage uh, internalization. And this is common to both the low Herfindahl index stocks and the high Herfindahl index stocks. The last results, results are correlative. So we try to establish causality by using the, uh, the SEC tick size pilot, pilot. And just to give you a, a brief over, overview of the tick size pilot, I think a lot of us are familiar with it already. Uh, they, um, the SEC increased the tick size to, uh, to five cents uh, from about October 2016 to October 2018. Okay. Group two, they saw their tick size for both quotes and trades increase to five cents. And group three, they saw the same thing, but trades on off exchange venues with no visible quotes were also prohibited. So this is essentially a trade at restriction. And it meant that internalization for TSP3 stocks, as in uh, group three stocks in the tick size pilot. Uh, internalization was essentially banned uh, with limited exceptions. 
So our FINRA data that we use, it does happen to overlap with the conclusion of the tick size pilots in October 2018. And what we find is that uh, the spreads for the tick size pilot group three stocks decreased by 22 basis points relative to the tick size pilot uh, group two stocks uh, during the pilot, but only for the high perfenolinic stocks category. So there was no change in relative spreads for low HHI stocks, but in the, for these stocks where there was like uh, less uh, competition for retail order flow, this is where we see uh, especially um, pronounced effects on the bid ask spread. So if you look at the bottom right graph, you can think of date zero as you can just consider it a, shock, a positive shock to internalization, as in internalization was reintroduced to the uh, group three stocks. And you can see that when internalization was reintroduced, then the quoted spread for those stocks goes up by 22 basis points uh, relative to the group two stocks. Uh, and that's when internalization was reintroduced and then internalization was uh, comparable once more uh, to the group two stocks. Um, that's essentially the results. Uh, I'll, I'll pause again if anybody has any questions before moving on. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, so Marius asks, do you see a shift in retail trading volume for GSP3 stocks or just in whether they're internalized or not? Um, sorry, I'm having trouble hearing. Uh, this is a question from who? Uh, from Marius Soika. Do you uh, see a shift in retail trading volume for TSP3 stocks yeah. or just in whether they're internalized or not? Yeah. yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. No, this is something we look at in, in the paper. Uh, if I recall, we, we, don't, we don't see a shift in actual retail volume, um, just, uh, just basically the percentage that's internalized. So I, uh, we try to look this at this in a few different ways to see if the composition of traders or anything like that changed around the TSP3. And it's, it's not something that we're seeing, but it's something that we're gonna look into in a lot more detail, uh, just to make sure that we really get this, uh, this mechanism right. But it's a great question. Then there's a, a question from Tom Ernst. Uh, when spreads go up, what happens to price improvements? Yeah, this is something that we also test later in the paper. Uh, you know, uh, we're mostly focused on spreads in this paper, but we do test a lot of other things like quoted, um, uh, like price improvement, uh, realized spreads, um, at the size of extreme price movements. We look at these sorts of things. Uh, what happens to price improvement? Uh, if I recall, uh, price improvements after the uh, restrictions are lifted, um, price improvement then, it then gets worse by about five percentage points uh, once internalization is reintroduced, but it's common to both the high HHI and the low HHI stocks. So I think what we notice is that the spreads get worse for the high HHI stocks only, uh, but we see price improvement get worse for both the high HHI and low HHI stocks. And we're going to talk about some theory in a second uh, about uh, why this might be the case, uh, but, but, but that's what we seem to find in the data. Okay, thanks. So one more question. Uh, okay. Uh, then uh, I'll let you move on. So Yunus Tokpas is asking, uh, did you conduct the spread and price improvement regressions for the pre-COVID period? So internalization may not be a big problem at the time uh, because the retail trade um, significantly increased after COVID. Right. Uh, we did not try to, we did not look at this. Uh, I, um, I think it's an interesting idea, um, but, but yeah, I think it could add, 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 add something to the paper for sure. Because our, our our data do overlap with uh, with I guess the, uh, the the COVID sample, especially when internalization, uh, I mean, especially when retail trading really took off. So I think this could be useful to look at as well. It's a great idea. Thanks. Good. So uh, I think we can move on. There's another question in the chat, but maybe Edwin uh, can look into that. Okay. Sounds good. Great. Uh, sorry. Just give me a second here. Okay, so, um, you know, I'll, I'll go over the related literature uh, really quickly. So, so I think that there's this really great paper by, uh, by Haggerty and McDonald um, that's, that's from a handbook on, inter on industrial organization uh, that's about competitive internalizers, in fact. I think they call them um, uh, brokers in their model, uh, but they show that they provide narrower spreads on their internal brokerage platform than the public market makers. Uh, but that's what happens when there's competitive internalizers. 
but when it's a monopolistic internalizer, they actually provide the same spread, which corresponds to price improvement when we're thinking about uh, internalization nowadays. So this is a paper I, I, I highly recommend that uh, you should check it out. It's a good one. Uh, another great paper is Vitaly and Holden, where they think about a monopolist internalizer, and they earn a positive rent because uh, they can uh, choose to purchase non-professional order flow, as in the order flow that's the safest for them. But because they're monopolists, they only have to pay an arbitrarily small amount for it. So another great theoretical paper. And then there's some related empirical literature, you know, uh, that's about cream skimming, uh, where uh, you know these papers by uh, uh, by by Eastley et al. and Bessenbinder et al. They show that uh, more informed order flow. Uh, no, cream skimming, sorry, is associated with more or informed order flow and lower realized spreads. And then another paper uh, by, by Carol um, Comerton Ford, and she shows that minimum price improvement in Canada. So there's this minimum price improvement rule in Canada that was introduced uh, that reduced dark pool trading and it actually improved lit market liquidity. Uh, so uh, th this was a pretty related study. Uh, we're taking the competition angle in this paper to show uh, how, how some of these results can be more, uh, um, more pronounced when you see a less competitive uh, uh, regime. So I'll go very quickly through the theoretical setup. We're thinking about a standard like one period Gloss and Milgram model where the value of the asset, it's not known except to inform traders. And it can take one or two values. Uh, it goes up by sigma or it goes down by sigma and the ex ante it's a uh, probability of 50-50. So the informed trader arrives with probability one minus delta and will buy if it's V, if they know it's VH and sell if they know it's VL. And the uninformed trader otherwise arrives and buys or sells the probability 0.5. All standard Gauss and Milgram stuff. A slight difference is that the uninformed order flow, uh, it goes to the public market with probability R and the premium for order flow market with probability one minus R. So you can think about what R might be, but some retail traders, they will manage to go to the lit markets uh, through whatever platform they're using. But then there's other retail traders that are going to go directly to the internalizer market. So as in Gloss and Milgram, uh, the ask price PA um, quoted by the public market maker, and the public market maker is somebody that is not an internalizer. They quote um, uh, an ask price of their expected value conditional on a buy coming in, and the bid price is the expected value conditional on a sell coming, uh, coming to their desk. So you use Bayes' rule and you find this for the bid and ask prices, and then you take the difference to get the spread. And the spread, um, it depends partially on the, uh, uh, the amount of um, internalized orders. Like R is how much that goes to the public market. Uh, and so um, you can see how the, uh, the spread uh, depends on R basically. Uh, so the, the spread is narrower as, as R is higher. Uh, nothing too surprising here. Um, so what I wanna say is that this is the spread quoted by the public market makers. And this is not necessarily the narrowest spread. It's the zero profit uh, bid and ask that they can quote themselves. Uh, so it's narrow spread quoted by this specific group of traders. So with this in mind, we're going to consider three settings in this model. We're going to consider no payment for order flow market as in R equals one. We're going to consider a payment for order flow market where the internalizers are perfectly competitive and a payment for order flow market with a monopolist internalizer. So the assumption here is that the internalizers are active on both the payment for order flow and the public markets. And we're going to assume too that the internalizer's objective is to maximize profits subject to wanting to quote the narrowest spreads uh, in uh, the public markets. And you can think that they want to uh, quote the narrowest spread because they always want to be uh, uh, providing business to incoming uh, traders on that market. And you can also assume maybe that they're trying to capture rebates and so on. And they're also subject to an IR constraint. They wanna be making uh, um, at least zero profit. And so the other assumption is that the internalizers, they incur an ex exogenous per share internalization cost of K greater than zero, which you can consider operational costs, the cost of paying for order flow. And you can also even think that K is less than zero on net if the economies of scale from large internalizers are sufficiently large. But just to keep things simple, let's just think about K greater than zero for now, as in these are the costs of internalization of handling the retail order flow. So what we get, uh, from these three settings are the following spreads. Uh, when there's no internalization, then you get a standard uh, Gloss and Milgram uh, uh, result, uh, where the, the, the spread is two times sigma times one minus delta. Okay, but then if you look at a limit order book with competitive internalizers, what's happening here is that, so when, when, when a fraction of the order retail order flow goes to the internalizers, then the spread becomes this right here on this slide. 
But if the internalizers are competitive, then they're going to try to undercut each other in the public markets. And if they undercut each other enough, such that they are perfectly competitive, then they're going to undercut each other until it's a zero profit condition for them as well. And it's the zero profit condition to the point where, um, where the bid ask spread is what it is in the, in the no internalization regime, plus what cannot be returned to the limit order book because of the internalization costs. So you can see that the spread is wider in this case because not everything that they benefit from in the internalization market is brought back and resubsidizing uh, the, uh, the payment for order flow market. This is the K that is kept by the internalizer in the form of, um, of having, to, uh, sub uh, ha having to pay for their operations and having to pay for order flow. Again, if you just consider K equal to zero, then these are the same. But if you think that internalizers are providing economies of scale net of their operational costs, then you can even think of K as negative. And if that's the case, then the spread will actually be narrower uh, than in the, um, uh, the no internalization regime. But for now, we're just thinking about K as positive. Now, if you think about panel C, this is when you have a monopolistic internalizer. And so in this case, the spread, uh, if you take away a certain fraction of the order flow, uh, then you're going to get this spread here. And if the monopolist internalizer wants to be quoting the narrowest spread, then everybody else, the, 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 the public market makers, are already at the zero profit condition with their uh, bids and offers. So they just need to quote uh, epsilon over, the, um, uh, over what the public market makers are quoting. That's all they have to do. And so therefore, you get that the spread is widest in this setting as well. Uh, and because of zero profit conditions, this is guaranteed to be wider uh, than, than the spread in panel B. So that's our main uh, prediction here is that uh, is that the spread is widest when you have a monopolistic internalizer. And so we think that if you have like more of a duopoly environment, then it's going to lie somewhere between the competitive internalizer environments and, mon and the monopolistic internalizer environment. But this is where we predict that the spreads would be largest. So this is what our empirical predictions are like based on, uh, based on this reasoning. Our first prediction is that the quota spread is increasing in the internalization rate one minus R. And then our prediction two is that for a fixed internalization rate, the quoted spread is higher under an oligopolistic internalizer regime, as in high HHI, compared to a competitive internalizer regime, low HHI. And then our prediction three is more of a reduced form prediction. Uh, this one states that as the internalization rate one minus R increases, then price improvement and market depth decrease, and the size of extreme price movements increases, especially for high HHI stocks. We think that, it's, that the market could be more fragile uh, for a high internalization rate uh, under a monopolistic regime or an oligopolistic regime, uh, because um, there might be some public market makers out there that might be disincentivized from posting liquidity as well, which could make the limit order book uh, thinner. And we think that, that price improvement could, uh, could be worse as well, because if it's a monopolistic internalizer, you know, maybe they're not subsidizing the spread as well, but maybe they're also just not providing as good price improvement. So, okay, those are our empirical predictions. Uh, so I'll move on to the empirical results next, uh, but I'll, I'll open the floor to questions again. Okay, so Josh, you go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks, Dermot. Sorry, I'm just, uh, maybe I'm a bit slow, but I was struggling to understand the model. If you go back a slide, uh, uh -huh. BBO spread, is, is this the spread on the exchange or is this yes. kind of some spread that's also taken into account um, price improvement? Uh, this is the spread on the exchange. Okay. So then, so if we compare panel A and panel B, in the case where K is equal to zero, you, you get the same spread. And that, that seems, feels counterintuitive to me because I was thinking, well, you know, in panel B, uh, you know, retail flow is getting pulled off of the exchange. That should make the exchange spread more toxic and that spread should be wider. Uh, but, but uh, um, you know, do you, do you see my question? Yeah, no, I do. I do. So, um, yeah, you're right. Like, this is what the spread would be if retail order flow was taken away from the exchange, uh, this, uh, this third equation here. But what we're arguing is that if the market makers, if the internalizers who also act as market makers are incentivized to use those profits to compete with each other to provide the narrowest spread on the exchange, then this is going to be the resulting spread. So they're going to take some of the money that they make from internalization to compete more with each other uh, to, uh, to provide the narrow spread on the public market. 
So they're going to be making good profits from internalization, but they're going to be making worse profits from, uh, from trying to provide the best spread in the public market, such that it's going to work out to a zero profit condition for these guys as well in the perfectly con uh, competitive setting. Okay, I guess I'll have to think about that more. I, I, I would have thought, you know, you'd, you'd want zero profits kind of market by market uh, rather than, but, but I'll, I'll think. Yeah, no, it's, 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 can, it's a really like good it. point, yeah. Marius. Uh, hi. One hi. thing I'm, I'm struggling with here is the fact that R is sort of exogenous. So it's not that the internalizers are sort of picking the order flow, it's more that the order flow is coming directly to the internalizer. And you know, to me, that's a bit confusing, but that means you can discern to some extent between informed and uninformed order flow. And also the more internalizers you have on the market, uh, if you have more competition or less competition, the share of order flow that goes to internalizer is always the same. So they always compete for a fixed slice of the pie instead of, let's say, internalizing the entire retail order flow, if there, if there are more of them. You see what I mean? The, the fact that R is fixed is a, is a bit problematic. I think I know what you mean. And this is something we thought about in the model as well, that um, internalization, like order flow from retail traders going through somewhere like Robinhood, it's going to be sent to internalizers, but internalizers can ship that off to the public market so that they can, they can maximize their profits by choosing um, R, in a sense. Um, and so that, I think that complicates the analysis. We're trying to think of here that there are some retail traders that they do uh, use platforms where, uh, where it is sent to a public market, uh, whereas others are sent to a mar market where uh, it, it is guaranteed to go to internalizers. But we are assuming in our model that the internalizers are going to execute against all of it. Uh, and I, I think that our model will largely capture what we're trying to say here, but they are going to choose to send some to uh, the public market. And so if they are doing that, it's probably because, well, retail order flow is all of a sudden really highly correlated. So that's gonna put a lot of pressure on their inventories because you're going to get these, uh, so like the retail investors that they're going to herd, like they have on Robinhood, for example. And so that order flow starts becoming a little scary. So you're gonna to have to start to step and ship some of that off to, uh, to the public market. You're still going to get an adverse selection problem. We might even be understating adverse selection here, actually, uh, uh, based on that. Uh, but uh, it's something that we'd like to see modeled in, in more detail. I think that this is very ripe for uh, for uh, for modeling in, in more detail. Actually, it's it's really interesting to me. Okay, uh, let's take one more question, but uh, and then proceed. Sean, um, how is your model different from uh, Parlor and Rajan? their 2003 paper in the GFE. Uh, can you remind me about that paper? Um, so they, they look at this issue and they find that when, my, my recollection is, is that underpayment for order flow, if you have it, that the spread should be wider because the wholesale market makers, when they purchase order flow, they may inadvertently purchase some informed order flow for which they have to cover the cost. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it looks think... it looks similar to you. I don't I, I can't comment on your C, but the, 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 the message is reminiscent of your panel B versus A. Oh, uh, for panel B versus A. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's some overlap there uh, because uh, this this is this has more to do uh, with um, uh, with a traditional cream skimming model, except for the fact that some of the bid ask spread is resubsidized. Uh, basically, like you take away retail order flow and it makes the spread wider, but then competition makes the spread narrower again as those internalizers also compete on the public market. So it's something that we haven't seen a lot that that it's an internalizer that can also be active on the public market. Like they're they're playing two roles here. Uh, and and I I'll have to read that paper again, but uh, my impression was that that was uh, that was newer to this literature. But the thing we're especially doing here is is taking the competition angle. Uh, to show that uh, that essentially when you have um, uh, little competition for retail order flow, then this resubsidization effect that we're talking about uh, doesn't really happen. And that's when you see uh, spreads being especially wide. And this two epsilon here, you can basically think of this as zero. And so the spread widens to um, what you see in this prediction right here, actually, uh, but just with a little tiny bit uh, narrowed uh, just, to, uh, just for that like de minimis uh, uh, competition effect. 
Okay, great, Dermot. I, I suggest that we uh, keep the rest of the questions until uh, after Dermot has concluded so that uh, we have time to, to finish on time here. All right, sounds great, thanks. Um, so, so yeah, the data we use is from the FINRA OTC ATS uh, transparency database. Uh, it provides uh, non-ATS uh, trades uh, by, uh, by firm. Uh, there, are, there is going to be some, um, uh, uh, some STP uh, volume uh, in there as well, but I think the lion's share of it really is uh, the retail order flow, like based on what I see from Rule 606 reports. Uh, but the data covers 2017 to 2021, which allows us to calculate uh, the percentage of volume that is internalized and also the, the Herfindahl index and an indicator variable for whether uh, it's, it's a high value. Uh, we also use the TAC ID database, which helps us to calculate some of our dependent variables, such as effective spread uh, and depth, uh, volatility, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, so we have some summary statistics here about internalization, and here are the graphs that I talked about earlier. Uh, HHI generally floats around 2,500, uh, gets as high as about 3,000, and you can see that Citadel on average, uh, according to our sample, uh, executes about 37% of the, of the volume that we're looking at from FINRA, whereas uh, Virtu uh, executes about 27%. And the average weekly volume is about $400 million. So uh, our baseline tests are going to focus on this percent int um, independent variable, and we're going to be interacting it with the high HHI independent variable. And we're going to see how these influence market quality outcomes. The ones we're especially interested in are the quoted spread, uh, like the percentage quoted spread, lower is better for traders. And then ESQS, which is the ratio effective spread to quoted spread, which is a standard industry metric for price improvement. Essentially, if that equals 0.95, it means uh, in general that trades do 5% better uh, than, uh, than the quoted spread. Uh, lower is also better for traders. Um, so, you know, before we move on to those regressions, we do look at uh, results by internalization quintile. And you see that percentage internalization, it ranges from 10% to 60%. HHI goes up, like it, it's, it's positively associated with the internalization quintile. And uh, it, it appears for the most part that the higher you go in the quintiles, the more is uh, executed by Citadel and Virtu. Uh, it's especially monotonic for Virtu, it seems. Uh, and then the market quality statistics, you see that quoted spread is widest in the highest internalization quintile. That's monotonic. Um, Price improvement gets worse uh, as you go up in the internalization quintile. And we have some other results for um, basically like the realized spread, which is the profits, um, uh, uh, which is like the gross profits retained by the market maker. And we have NBBO depth and extreme price movement uh, size, uh, which uh, for the most part all seem to be going up as well. Depth, it's a little more mixed. Uh, but uh, in terms of the regression that I was talking about two slides ago, we do indeed see that, uh, that the higher your uh, percentage internalization rate is, uh, the higher your quoted spread is, uh, but it's especially true for the high HHI category. Um, so that's where we really see a market quality effect as a function of competition. Uh, but when we looked at price improvement in the form of effect of the quoted spread, then you see that um, the higher your percentage internalization, then uh, the worse your price improvement, uh, but there is no incremental effect for the, uh, uh, for the high HHI stocks. Um, and so I'll, I'll provide some uh, quantitative and uh, like economic interpretations later, uh, but, but this is essentially what we find here. Uh, so like I was talking about earlier, we wanna address the whole issue that this, uh, this, these results are pretty correlative. So we wanna try to establish a causal connection. So we are using the SEC size pilot. Uh, you know, it, it, we might not have causal results because it's possible, for example, that riskier stocks will have higher spreads and they might attract more retail volume. So the, the, the inherent riskiness of the stocks could be driving the previous results. But we use the SEC tick size pilots. Uh, you know, there are four different groups of 400 stocks each. They did random stratified sampling so that the distribution of the stocks were similar across test groups according to price, um, uh, market cap, and volume. Uh, control group is tempting to use because they call it the control group. Uh, but it's not what we're going to use. We want to use test group two as the control group because they increased quoting and trading increments by five cents. And so did test group three, but then test group three throw, threw in the trade at restriction as well. Uh, so the difference between test group two and test group three is just going to be that internalization restriction. Uh, and so what we do indeed find is that uh, the internalization rate is a lot lower for the test group three stocks during the tick size pilot. But after the tick size pile concludes, then the internalization rate uh, increases back to the level that's comparable to the TSP2 stocks. 
Um, and it seems like we were, we're not surprised by, by the balance between TSP2 and TSP3 uh, because they were matched on some pretty important uh, characteristics like price volume, price volume and uh, market cap. But we do compare things like the percentage internalization and HHI and so on uh, outside of the tick size pilot. And everything is pretty comparable. Uh, so I, I think that we have a, a pretty, a pretty uh, balanced sample here. But having established like what happens to internalization for the test group three stocks, uh, we then like run this sort of regression, right? Where we're going to look at uh, basically the market quality metrics, uh, like how they change uh, after the conclusion of the tick size pilot, uh, so as indicated by the post indicator variable. So we're going to be interacting the post indicator variable with TSP3, which is an indicator variable for stocks in TSP3. And if that equals zero, then you're in TSP2. So this sample consists of just the TSP2 and TSP3 stocks. And then we're going to be doing a triple difference that has the high HHI indicator variable as well to see if basically the effect on the TSP3 stocks after the conclusion of the internal, uh, after the conclusion of the tick size pilot, to see if those effects, if they're there, are especially pronounced for the high HHI stocks. And our X here uh, carries a lot of things, like it carries like our control variables that we use throughout the study our standard controls, and it also has uh, the, uh, uh, the, the double interaction terms uh, that, that aren't as important for our purposes, but, but they are there. And so like I showed earlier, this is the result, right? So uh, starting in week zero, the, this is the week of the tick size pilot conclusion, we do see that, uh, that spreads for the TSP3 stocks go up by 22 basis points relative to the TSP2 stocks after internalization is reintroduced for the TSP3 stocks. So basically what this graph says is that more internalization, uh, wider spreads. But we don't see it for the low HHI stock category. There's no significant change here. So this is consistent with our model, uh, which, which uh, predicts basically that when you don't have much competition uh, for retail order flow, uh, then you're going to see spreads uh, that, that are a lot worse. But at least when you see more competition for retail order flow, uh, then sure, there is going to be a, a payment for order flow um, that's going to be happening, but at least there's going to be more competition to narrow spreads uh, using, um, uh, using profits from the payment forward flow market. Um, and this is in regression form. Like we see that for the quoted spread, uh, the results are exclusive to the high HHI category, uh, but for effective decoded spread, which is where we have more reduced form predictions, we find that, uh, the, that price improvement gets worse for both the low HHI and high HHI stocks. And so if we try to estimate like the, the economic effects, we find that, you know, during that sample period, uh, during our sample period for high HHI stocks, there was about $18.5 trillion in, in volume. So we estimate that it, it, that it corresponds to about like $7 billion, like due to the internalization restriction. Um, and that's what the cost would be. Now there's going to, uh, I mean, that's what, that would, that's what the benefit would be if there was an internalization restriction, but there are costs to having an internalization restriction as well, because if everybody has to send their orders to the stock exchange, then there's on exchange take fees, right? Uh, and they're, and they're, usually, um, they're usually three tenths of a penny per share. Um, and so that corresponds to about, about $140 million in costs if you did in, implement these internalization restrictions. It's the combination of the on-exchange take fees and the loss of internalization uh, price improvements. Uh, if you think that the payment for order flow ultimately trickles down to the consumers through the broker, then you can add another maybe um, uh, 10th or 20th of a, of a penny to that, uh, but um, it might increase that, that $140 million to maybe $180 million or so. Uh, but my main takeaway here uh, is that uh, the costs of the internalization restriction, uh, they do appear lower uh, than the benefits of the, the spread benefits of the internalization restriction, uh, at, at least based on these tests. We have a few other tests as well. We look at realized to effective spread, which is essentially like a, a proxy for uh, the profitability, the gross profitability of the market maker uh, relative to the effective spread. And we find that after the internalization restrictions are lifted, public market makers lose about 6% of their profits. Uh, not too surprising here, this is cream skimming, so it's going to be a lot more dangerous order flow on the exchange. Uh, and so um, uh, basically it's going to be less profits for the public market makers. Uh, and we don't see uh, any, any significant change for the, uh, the high HHI category in this case. 
And finally, we look at depth and the uh, and the size of extreme price movements, like the 99.9th uh, percentile of uh, of price movements. Uh, we see that depth there is like um, a decrease in depth once internalization uh, is reintroduced. Uh, it's not really sig statistically significant, which uh, it, which is kind of uh, reflecting our, our internalization quintile analysis from earlier. Uh, but we see that there's a there's a very weak uh, a decrease. But at least with extreme price movements, we do see that there's a significant increase in the size of extreme price movements after the internalization restrictions are, are lifted. Uh, but it, 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 is, it seems to be confined to the high HHI category. And so this is consistent with our, our intuition that um, if public market makers aren't able to compete with the internaliz internalizers who are able to provide narrow spreads because they're making good money, basically, uh, then they're going to not quote uh, uh, provide quotes at all. And that's going to make the, uh, the limit order book a little thinner. And I find that this last result, it does underline an additional concern by Gary Gensler that um, that concentration in the payment forward flow market, it can increase uh, potential system-wide risks. That's something else that he says in his speech. So this is the conclusion. So we use the, the, the tick size pilot to provide causal evidence that internalization is associated with worse market quality, especially for the high HHI stocks. And we find that the uh, full sample evidence, while correlative, we think that uh, it suggests that the TSP results uh, from the tick size pilot, uh, they're externally valid to a broader setting. So we don't necessarily suggest that um, internalization should be banned or significantly restricted because the system can provide benefits. It's allowing retail traders to avoid on exchange take fees and it may have partially contributed to, I'm guessing 50 cents possibly in their reduction in commissions in recent years. But broadly what our results would suggest is that reducing barriers to entry, i.e. promoting competition to internalize retail order flow, uh, we estimate that this could uh, save uh, uh, investors billions of dollars in transaction costs uh, per year. All right, thank you for listening. Thanks a lot, uh, Dermot. Uh, we're almost reaching uh, the full hour here. So for those of you who have to leave after one hour, thanks a lot for coming. And we will be back in, in two weeks with a talk by Vincent van Kervel. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, Dermot is happy to stay and uh, take more questions, right? Of course, yeah. Yes. So, uh, Adam. Hi, how are you? Uh, but for that presentation and presenting your work. I, I had a question uh, about the methodology. So can, can you describe the methodology uh, that you used that allowed you to measure the internalization percentage from the FINRA data? In particular, how did you identify which orders were internalized by wholesalers and how did you identify which orders were sent by wholesalers to, to be externalized but executed in public marketplaces? Because that's just not clear to me how that's possible or how you did it. I mean, as far as I understand from the FINRA data is that it, it provides you with, uh, uh, with the, with the non-ATS order flow that's executed by different market making firms. And so we're, we're adding up that order flow across the market making firms to get, a, to get an idea of total uh, retail internalization, um, uh, like total retail order flow. And then we take the percentage like based on, based on each of those, those firms. And like I was saying earlier, there are some issues with that for the lower volume stocks because Finner doesn't report internalization if you're below, I think, um, 1,000 trades per week, which I actually think is pretty high, but it's considered de minimis if it's... Uh, uh, if it's below 1,000 trades per week, I think, uh, but but that's essentially how we're like calculating like percentage internalization. Like we're looking at like we add up the volume across non ATSs within the FINRA data, and then take that as a percentage of total volume that we find from the TAC data. Uh, but then when we calculate HHI, we're basically like summing the squared market share across like the six uh, market making firms, basically. So let me make sure I understand it correctly. Are you saying that you take any of the um, executed trades in the FINRA data that's that, that that's um, reported as a dark trade as to be, to be a retail internalized trade? Um, no, not not exactly because this is the non ATS order flow. There's also the ATS order flow, so we're we're focusing on non ATS. Okay. So Andrew, you're next in line, and uh, please keep it a bit short as there are many hands lined up here. Yes, I will. I apologize again for last time. I just have one quick question. I apologize. I promise it's just one. It's just what barriers to entry are you aware of to the internalizing 
to internalizing retail order flow, just kind of the key takeaway at the bottom of this slide. Um, so I kind of get your views on that. That's my I only mean, question. I mean, my impression is that uh, that it's, it's not like somebody like, like myself could try to internalize retail order flow. It would be nice if I were able to go onto a broker platform and check off a box that says, uh, you know, I, I would like to uh, essentially uh, place this order and wait for a retail trader to come along and then we can agree to trade maybe at the midpoint instead of uh, instead of me trying to like profit from the bid ask spread. But if I can find another retail trader and, and execute at the midpoint instead, uh, kind of like a dark pool, but but just with ease of use through a platform like Robinhood, then I would be all about that. That would be great. So that would be that would be kind of me competing for a retail order flow by, by saying that that's something that I would like. Uh, I've heard that there are there have been firms that have tried to basically get in on uh, this space by uh, uh, by trying to get some of the order flow routed their way, but uh, but I hear that for for some firms it just hasn't worked out as well. You know there there have been attempts, but they've just kind of dropped out of the space, kind of like Wolverine has uh, like uh, like last year. At least that's my impression. Uh, so well, uh, let me answer this one. I think that. Right, go ahead. Andrew, you would probably agree that what makes a wholesaler good at their business is in some sense economies of scale. And so kind of building up the scale can be difficult for new entrants. There can be high fixed cost of entry to build uh, you know, the order routing systems that Citadel and Virtu have. And then there's the other issue of building a track record of executing retail orders in a way that can prove to retail brokers that you're going to be able to handle their order flow well. And you know, if you've never executed retail orders before, you don't have a track record to show folks. So you know, we'll see. These things might change. Technology can improve, and we're starting to see new entrants uh, like Hudson River Trading is going to get into this business. Um, I mean, so Jane, maybe maybe Jane Street's there up could to be thirteen like percent now. Exactly, in and Jane Street months. is a very good trading firm. Two Sigma also is in this space. They're a For very sure. good, reputable trading firm. So technological changes may uh, result in increased competition. And if that happens, you know, then perhaps no regulatory changes need to occur. But, uh, you know, given what we see right now in the data, the concentration of um, <clears throat> in the non-ATS executed volume is very concentrated according to most conventional measures. Uh, and so, you know, We've seen that uh, Doug is welcome to competition in this space, and we think that's very productive. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think you know it's always a a, a temptation to see concentration and, and assume a lack of competition. But you know, to your point, it's a very scaled business um, with high you know high fixed costs that uh, and high expectations of service. You know, the SLA, uh, the implied SLA um, expectation from the buyers of, of the wholesaling services are very high. Um, I think it's something that, that, that they can demand that because the competition is so stiff. But I, I, I see your points. Thanks. Thanks for taking my question, guys. Yeah, thanks. Josh. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the, the interesting talk. Um, one more clarification question about the model. Um, so, so if I was following correctly, it seemed like in the model, kind of the way you were thinking about it is that um, concentration in, in the internalization market is perfectly correlated with concentration of on exchange market making. Uh, and I, I guess my first question is just, is that right? Did I, did I get that right? Uh, sorry, can you say that again? The concentration in the internalization market. Yeah, in, in your model is the way you're kind of thinking the model that, that the concentration in internalization is perfectly correlated with concentration for on exchange market making. Uh, is 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 that is that what's going on in your model? Is that how you're? I think that that's something that could be inferred from the model actually, because if there's more concentration in internalization, uh, then then it basically means that you have more profits for competing to provide the narrowest spread, uh, and th that means that at least according to the model, it means that you are going to be the market maker that. Uh, that basically provides liquidity in the public market more often. Now, now I think Andrew had a, a question about this earlier. I would love to see like what percentage of orders are executed in the public, like in the lit limit order books by this firm, that firm, and that firm. I think that would be really great to see because I would especially love to know concentration for liquidity provision in the public market. I think it'd be extremely valuable to know that, but I don't know. Uh, what that percentage would be, but our model suggests that it would be more concentrated in the public market, 
if there was more concentration in the internalization market. Okay, but so in, so in the model, like the at least at least in the model, the answer is the answer is yes. Is that did I, did I get that right? They will like be looking at the narrowest. regime. With, yeah. So when there's more concentration, they'll be providing the narrowest spread, so that it's going to be especially a lot of concentration. Yeah, for sure. The prediction of our stylized model. Are there any uh, other questions out there now? Yes, Andrew. Thank you. Um, just curious how, you know, we, we talk about wholesaling and internalization, and it's often, you know, implicitly tied to payment for order flow. What about the brokers? You know, there's 250 brokers in the US that the virtue services and only 10 or 11, I think, Adam, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, charge payment for order flow. So what about big, you know, blue chip brokers like Fidelity, Vanguard, et cetera, that, you know, send flow to wholesalers because of the execution quality that they receive, you know, and they do experiment statistics. They, they look at a lot of metrics, just kind of curious how that ties with the notion that they may not be doing um, the best by their customers. I mean, we're not saying that they're doing, they're not doing the best by their customers necessarily. Like we're saying that this is like, at least according to our model, the equilibrium that's here is that you're gonna get wider spreads with a little price improvement. And we're wondering if there's a better equilibrium where there are narrower spreads and not as much price improvement perhaps. Uh, and I think that, that you could be better off in an equilibrium where there are narrower spreads with less in price improvement than very wide spreads with more price improvement, whatever that price improvement might be. Maybe it's a hundredth of a penny, maybe it's a tenth of a penny, maybe two tenths of a penny. Uh, so, so to your question about places like, like Fidelity, right, that, that don't charge for payment for order flow, uh, I mean, this is still retail order flow that's being diverted away from the public exchange. And there are debates to be had about that. I mean, if it's diverted from the public exchange and you get more toxic order flow, which widens spreads, but you are also uh, avoiding uh, like on exchange take fees. And I also wouldn't want to see something like an exchange monopoly either. Uh, so um, so I, I think that, I, I, like I, I can't fully predict like why Fidelity is, is, uh, is, is acting in this way, like why they would want to send order flow uh, without getting any payments. Uh, like uh, it must be because they think that that's the best execution, but that's based on the equilibrium that we're in right now, that that could be the best, uh, the best, uh, the, like the best execution that they can get in this equilibrium. But, but what we're saying is that like, if we were able to like uh, increase competition in this space somehow for retail order flow, then could we be in a different equilibrium that would make uh, traders better off? And I guess what would the trade-off be to get into that equilibrium, right? Any sort yeah, of there could be costs associated with that. I mean, I, I know that uh, that Gensler and the SEC they're they're talking about uh, the possibility of uh, of auctioning off retail order flow. You know, we're not taking a position on that sort of thing, but they they are thinking about ways to increase competition for retail order flow. And this auction system is one way that they're thinking about. Like I said, we're not taking a position on on that approach, uh, but 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 there are thoughts about how to attempt to improve sure. competition for retail order yeah. flow. Yeah, no, and as, as you mentioned, you know, there's any, there's, there's trade-offs with any change, right? And any change holistically to anything, whether it's anything we're talking about or topics we haven't even discussed today, like changes have trade-offs, right? There's impl implicit inherent trade-offs in there, whether it's a trade-off to, to competitors, to investors, to competition among venues, competition on a venue, stuff like that. Um, those are all things to be considered, so. Cool. Yeah, and we think about trade-offs in this paper, and we do uh, we do look at the costs and the benefits. Um, we can think more about other possible costs, but at least uh, like based on what we've looked at so far, uh, we uh, we think that the benefits of competition outweigh the costs. But if we can think about more uh, of the adjustment costs, then then that that could be useful as well. I think. Yeah, I mean, I think fundamentally the the benefits to retail come from segmentation, right? And any sort of change should, in in my view, at least preserve that, that segmentation for retail. You know, even, even if we open up more competitors, more, more ways for retail people to interact with retail. You mentioned earlier, you know, the ability to post a, to wanting to trade at midpoint. You know, that is something that people can do today. Arguably there's ways, there's better way, there, there should be better ways for you to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, as long as that segmentation is preserved so that retail can get a price that is good for retail, um, you know, we think that, 
you're able to retain that benefit. Otherwise, retail is kind of giving away the, the value of their own order. Yeah, no, point well taken. It, it's a whole other topic to think about the fact that there are retail retail traders out there that are actually represented by institutional players. And if the institutional players are, are, are incurring higher costs on public exchanges, then that can trickle down to the retail traders that are buying into uh, mutual funds and so on. But there's a large variety of institutional players. So that's a whole other uh, topic about, you know, the net welfare to, I wouldn't say retail traders, but just like retail market participants, like some of which yeah, trade that's a good way to put it. funds yeah. and so on. Yeah, I hate calling them traders. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, retail investors. Yeah. Thanks again. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Adam, did you want to come in as well? Oh, I have a completely separate question, but I don't know where I am in the queue of questions. So <laughs> you, you're next. <laughs> okay. Uh, by the way, I really do appreciate answering all the all, all the various questions that I had. I had just one more about your theoretic the theoretical model, and it, it, it pertains to the question I asked in the chat. Um, first, you, you, you know, I, I wanted to understand why there was. Um, why in the theoretical model there is a link between the on exchange quote in, in the panels that you described in a few slides back and and the wholesaling and I think that in the chat uh, or, or, or one answer you gave was that um, was, was that there's sort of an assumption that the profits from one can be used to subsidize the other. Um, not my question is this I I kind of I kind of want to understand why um, you came to that thought process to begin with or where, where did that come from. Um, do you have any evidence that, that that people are that that they're that wholesalers are doing this? Um, just where did that come from? I mean, well, we should talk to wholesalers more about whether this sort of assumption like matches up with reality. I mean, it's it's a good question. Uh, I think that if you have a large firm like Virtu, where you are, uh, and the firm is highly profitable, uh, then I think that divisions under that umbrella are going to um, are going to benefit from that profitability. And sometimes the profitability will uh, will be more heavily skewed toward one division or, or the other. But then when those profits like come like to the, the overall corporation, like Virtu in this case, like hypothetically, uh, then sometimes some of those profits can be used to, uh, to invest in better technology for another division, or it can be used to, um, uh, to provide better spreads. So we're not exactly saying that, you know, this penny of internalization profit we make here, we're bringing it straight over to the, to the market making division. Um, but this is a stylized model that says, well, they do come over uh, to a different division. But if we think that there's some sort of friction there where like the profits are, are perfectly isolated, then it wouldn't happen. But if the profits like are, are somewhat fluid between divisions under the overall umbrella of a firm, uh, then we could actually introduce like some sort of um, coefficient that that states like what percentage of profits could be uh, shipped over. Yeah, I think I think this kind of relates. Like, when you're under an umbrella of a firm, like a profitable division should benefit the whole firm. Like that's that's our that's our assumption here. But I, but we would like to talk to uh, yeah, more uh, I, market making firms about this. Sort I of can idea. look. I can I can speak for only one of the wholesalers, right? Um, and you all could probably guess which one. No, I've met you guys before, but others can guess which one. Um, I can speak for one of the wholesalers, and we're happy, you know, happy, happy to have that conversation. But this this assumption in particular just stuck out to me as, um, you know, potentially pro potentially problematic. But we can. We I think can this relates to Josh's comment earlier about like you know whether they should be maximizing profits at the individual desk level versus at the firm level. And we're kind of thinking about it at the firm level. So we can think about, you know, under what conditions the two might be equivalent. Uh, but we take your point that, yeah. you know, there might not be a shared pool of profit in this way that we're assuming at Virtu. But, you know, there might be other things like shared risks across desks that are relevant to how uh, trading strategies are determined. Yeah, and every firm might run, decide to run their business um, at, at a business level differently. You know, make business decisions decisions differently. Uh, again, from from I I I know how one firm does it. <laughs> um, um, but anyway, thanks for answering the question, and thanks for the just the whole presentation as well. Yeah, thanks for the great questions. Like we do think, like we we talked about economies of scale earlier in the presentation. And we think that the larger firms do benefit from economies of scale, like they can provide like higher quality services because of their their size, like presumably. Um, and so when you think about economies of scale, like is it that you have a large firm 
and you have a large division and that division benefits from economies of scale or is it that the whole firm is large and so therefore economies of scale they uh they pass through to the divisions um and i guess that's on a case-by-case -case uh, basis on how much like general economies of scale like pass down to the individual divisions even if more of those economies of scale like come from one division more than than the other okay so we uh, had one more question in the chat here uh, maybe it's been resolved now Jonas, do you do you still want to ask the question in, in voice no i think they checked so my question was about the do a minimus rule because it was abolished in december 2019 so like the, this might cause jumps in virtue and saddle volumes for certain stocks especially the illiquid stocks so there was no chance to distinguish how the illiquid stocks before to december 2019 but once the, this rule was abolished we know more about the volume. So I just asked, but the Edwin already answered. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are Great. there any remaining questions? I don't see any more questions at the moment. So uh, let's all uh, thank uh, Dermot and uh, Edwin for, for the presentation and thanks everyone for, for coming and, uh, uh, and uh, having such a nice discussion here. So uh, thank you and uh, have a good day or a good evening uh, wherever you are. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.